from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. Well, I've been uh, holding off telling you the news. I guess, I guess I'm ready to tell you. Uh, looks like I'm going to be in the belly of the beast. I will be covering the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. I haven't, um, the reason I've been reticent about telling you is I haven't got my credentials officially yet, but it seems like it's all in order. Um, yeah, under the auspices of the Pacifica Radio Network, I've been hired to be one of uh, their reporters. So, <laughs> wish me luck. Yeah, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be in the middle of it. And man, have I got mixed feelings. I mean, of course, it's historic, that's for sure. It's historical. I never, I'm never quite sure the correct usage of historic versus historical. Maybe one of you grammarians out there can set me straight. But yeah, so, so I'm going to be there. I need some advice. What, what would you, um, how would you tell me to approach this? Because the first thing I think of is the, is the big uh, 1939 American Nazi rally, their own uh, Make America Great Again rally in uh, Madison Square Garden. If you've never seen footage of that, uh, check it out. Uh, just just uh, search uh, 1939 Nazis Madison Square Garden. Uh, I saw a documentary about it. There's lots of footage out there to be seen. Yeah, there was quite a big uh, movement in those days, and they were using much of the similar language. Very nationalist, very pro-American, anti-immigrant, Christian nationalist, anti-everybody else. And they cloaked it in this super patriotic America first kind of garb. Looks just all really very, very familiar. So that's how I think about this Republican convention here in Milwaukee, right down here at Fiserv Forum. So, yeah, it, as soon as my credentials come through, it looks like it's happening. Uh, I'm going to be down there for you, and I'm going to be covering it. And I'm, uh, on one hand, I'm very glad for the opportunity to to be there to witness history and to help record some truths out of all the lies because, you know, it's going to be nothing but lies and, you know, tinfoil hats and craziness down there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited and I'm, well, I'm excited. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know what the other emotion is. There are the, the other many emotions are. So, uh, Stay tuned. Uh, keep this would be a good time to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, at least for the month of July, I'm going to uh, pry open my wallet and spring for the unlimited data usage. And at least for the month of July, I'll have unlimited space, and I'll probably probably be doing a daily kind of a daily journal. We'll see how it all works out. And then, of course, my reports uh, that I'll be filing for Pacifica. I'll let you know where to hear those. So there you go. Wish me luck. Wish me luck. Uh, Okay, got to talk about this for just a minute. I'm just so disgusted by the Hunter Biden story. You know that he was found guilty on all three felony counts. He checked the wrong box. Basically, he lied, saying he wasn't addicted to drugs. And then he, another count for actually possessing the gun. The the reason I'm upset is not because of the verdict. The the jurors really had no choice. It was a pretty simple case. The only leg he had to stand on was something that I was, I, I mentioned last week or the week before that he had just come out of rehab when he uh, bought that gun and checked the box on the background check. And in his mind, uh, he was no longer a drug addict. So that's that's what I saw just from the, the coverage I'd seen and the headlines I've been reading, 
But then, uh, according to the uh, testimony, or the uh, evidence, rather, they found a text, I guess, from Hunter himself, like days after he bought the gun, indicating that he was back on drugs. So, <laughs> so he, yeah, he, um, he was sober for a little while, a matter of days, I guess. And then, he, and then he did the old backslide, which happens to addicts. So I don't know if you, <laughs> I've had, I've had friends and, and family who, uh, who smoke and, um, they've quit several times as smokers do. But as soon as you snuff out that cigarette, you say, okay, that's my last one. As of this moment, I'm a non-smoker. <laughs> well, can you say that? Can you say that like one minute after the last one? Or do you have to wait a day? Maybe even if you have to wait 24 hours, I don't know. But you, I guess you could say that. And then if after a day or two, you, uh, you fall off the wagon, there was a time there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be any uh, expert on the Biden case because from every report I hear, it wasn't that tough a decision for the jurors. What I'm upset about is that it ever came to trial in the first place. Uh, I mentioned uh, last time we spoke, the numbers are minuscule, less than 1%. It's like 0 point something uh, percent of cases like this even come to trial. The thing he was charged with, the lying on the form and possessing a gun, those are almost never charged in and of themselves. Typically, they're charged along with other crimes like, oh, You use the gun to rob a liquor store. All right. So now we can tack on these other things because they're also true. But Hunter Biden had this gun for a grand total of 11 days. And uh, I can't find any reports that say otherwise. He never he literally never used it, let alone in the commission of a crime. So so this never, ever should have come to trial it probably shouldn't even been charged and if it had they should have just had a plea deal it should have been cut and dried it should have been easy um and they did have a plea deal several months back but it went foul so this is just sad and horrible for just everybody and especially because uh we touched on this last week we didn't get in too much detail the um, I'm I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna get on uh, the Orange Menace bandwagon and say how corrupt the justice system is, no. But it's uh it's screwy because Merrick Garland basically gave in to the pressure from the uh, right wing crazies who are just insisting that they hit Hunter with something. They've been fishing since uh, before the 2020 election for something on the Bidens, of course. And they've had all these congressional hearings and congressional investigations, and, you know, they want to impeach, and they call it the Biden crime family. It's all just so ridiculous. It's tinfoil hat stuff. All the work they've done, they haven't found anything. They just, they because they can't find anything. But the pressure was on. And Merrick Garland... And the Democrats generally have to always be just going out of their way to kowtow to this pressure. Oh, look how fair we are. We're going to we're going to charge the president's son. See how fair we are. So everybody's at fault for very different reasons. It's just, um, yeah, the Hunter case just really. And there was no way (laughs) there was no way to win after the verdict. If the verdict had come back not guilty, the right would have gone insane. But it came back guilty and they still went insane just in a different way. Oh, it's and and some of the, the some of the stories are so ridiculous. Like uh, Joe uh, set up his own son to create a distraction against something or other. Uh, they just got a hundred different reasons why this not only doesn't prove that the uh Joe Biden Justice Department 
isn't crooked. In fact, they they they, they twist it to somehow say that that this is proof that it is corrupt. I don't know how they do it. Their logic is, well, you know. And all of them, just all of them, all of them, the whole the whole Republican Party. That's why going to this convention is, um, yeah, I feel like I'm covering the Nazis of 1939 in a, in a Madison Square Garden because that's how they're acting. They just lie. They abuse their power. Um, so, yeah, the Hunter Biden thing just does not make me happy for a lot of reasons. I don't blame the jurors. They didn't really have a choice once they were sent off to deliberate. It's like, well, okay, there it is. But it, it never should have happened. And now he's and now he's going to be up for the. Um, he's got another case coming, several counts. I don't know how many on uh, taxes that he didn't pay. The guys, you know, the guys messed up. He's the black sheep of the family. He was. He's the little brother. His father's the vice president. Then the president. His brother was damn near the uh, uh, governor of Delaware would have been if he hadn't died of cancer as a hero, a war hero and a, a social justice hero and a hero of local and state and federal government. And, oh, he's just this big, you know. So, yeah, Bo is the screw up. Bo, and, and every family has one. I just feel nothing but complete empathy and sympathy for the whole damn family. I mean, I, I say a lot of things about Joe Biden. I got a lot of gripes about Joe Biden. But uh, he's, he's doing the right thing here. He says all the right things, and it's all what it should be. I love my son. I support my son, but I'm, I'm also the president. I'm not going to pardon him. I'm not going to step in. I'm not going to comment on, on the uh, judicial process. It's, you know, we have to have faith in our institutions, you know, blah, blah, blah. All very good. All what he should say. And it, absolute 180 from what the orange, the kind of things the orange menace says. And he forces his toadies to say. And that's all they are now, are just a bunch of toadies. So, you know, good for him. Uh, love your son. That's You should do that. And so I, I, I give him credit for that. I, for all the complaining I do about Joe. I, I think he's genuinely a good person. I think he loves the country. I think he loves his family. I think he's trying to do the right thing. He, even in Israel, God, it kills me to say it. We'll get to that in a minute. We got to talk a little bit about that today. All right. Well, are we done with this? I'm done with this. So, um, Hunter Biden will never own a gun again, and and neither will the Orange Menace, because he's also a convicted felon. And, oh, they can't associate. They can't hang out. They can't be friends. The Orange Menace and Hunter Biden can't uh, associate because they're both felons. And you can't associate with criminals when you're, when you're on probation. So uh, they'll never be friends. Uh, that's sad. Too bad. But yeah, Trump, uh, he had to turn in, I guess he had three guns. He had to turn them in. <laughs> oh, oh, did you hear this? That reminds me. Um, apparently, uh, felons can't have a liquor license in some states. Or uh, I think, I think I, the story I read in New Jersey where his Bedminster Club is, I don't know about Mar-a-Lago, probably the same. Kind of innocuous language. You have to be of good character, and you can't have something or other. But um, yeah, from what I hear, <laughs> he might not be able to get a liquor license for his golf clubs because he's a convicted felon. So <laughs> everybody have fun at Bedminster and Mar-a-Lago, drinking your root beer. <laughs> I, that, so, some of these little side stories are so just wonderful uh, golf is weird though the weirdest thing about golf and this is really weird it's the um it's the clubs not no not the not the sticks not the clubs you hit with it's the golf club it's the venue it's the dining room and the pro shop and the bar and the people who hang out and Golf clubs, golf resorts, 
are weird. They're just weird, weird places. The kind of people who hang out, I'm being very judgmental now, I, I admit it. Because I spent some time, I spent a while uh, as a musician. You know, in my other life, I'm a musician. At least I was. I'm kind of mostly retired now. But uh, I played a lot of golf clubs because they hire guys like me, just, you know, solo voice and guitar, just to got to do background music and stuff or play a party or play a dinner or something. And so I spent a lot of time in golf clubs. And man, it's um, not to stereotype, but man, they live up to it. Just conservative and the golf clothes and just the types of people, the men, the women, the way they interact, the way they talk, the things they talk about. I overheard conversations. They were all very, very conservative, very money oriented, talking about what vacation they went on or what addition to their new house. And I'm not loving it. It's, you know, golf clubs live up to the stereotype in my experience. I've never been to a golf club that didn't just totally give me the creeps. So I don't know, maybe your experience is different, but that's mine. Okay. So, uh, well, I put this off long enough. I got to talk about it. Speaking of, um, Joe and Israel, Jesus Christ, this, uh, this latest attack happened, I guess, over the weekend man alive i'm sure i'm sure you've heard about it over 274 palestinians killed and the big headline was four hostages rescued the israeli defense forces went in by air uh first they had drones unmanned drones firing at random just they were dropping bombs In come the guys with the rifles. This was a full-out attack, purportedly, to uh, rescue hostages. Now, yes, of course, Hamas uses human shields. Yes, that's what Israel keeps telling us. Okay, fine. Yes, they do. Sure, I'm not going to deny that. But uh, if you saw Dog Day Afternoon, They didn't just uh, descend on that bank. They just didn't smash in the windows, guns firing. They didn't drop a bomb on the bank. No, there were hostages in there. I mean, I know it's a stupid analogy, but but it's not really. I mean, Israel keeps saying, oh, it's tragic that civilians die. And then they uh, also rightfully, like I said, they point out the fact that Hamas, they set up their uh, operations in civilian areas. And yeah, they do. But I don't don't know how you go from there to the decision that you just bomb the hell out of a whole neighborhood, kill 275 people, including three hostages, by the way. Three hostages were killed in order to save the four hostages. It just doesn't make any damn sense. The, uh, The UN has declared war crimes on both sides. I'm perfectly willing. See, this is the thing. When you criticize Israel, as I've been doing, along with many other people, it doesn't mean that we're defending Hamas. It, it, it doesn't mean that we're turning a blind eye. But there's a pretty big and obvious difference that you ought to realize, and that is that the American government and Joe Biden and Congress are not supporting Hamas. They're not sending them millions of dollars. They're not sending them 2,000-pound bombs like we're sending to the IDF. The U.S. label is all over these munitions, these last couple of attacks. There was one a week or two ago, the 45 killed at the school, and we thought that was horrific, and then right on the heels of that, 270. About 60 plus, uh, I guess, what did I hear? 64, five of those were children. Another 700 injured. And yeah, U.S. labels are on those munitions. And not only that, the U.S. has come right out and admitted. They gave them, they gave Israel uh, intelligence. They helped with intelligence. They had surveillance drones, logistical help, planning. Uh, This attack was planned for like two weeks. So, 
Joe Biden, are you are you aware? Does your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Because his left hand, he gets all of all of his staff together. Said, "Come on, you guys, come up with a nice ceasefire plan that we can propose," and they do. And they so they propose a ceasefire plan. They call it the Israeli plan. They th- maybe they think that Netanyahu will like it better if if they call it that. It's just all so silly. So it passes the UN Security Council, the first one to pass without a, a United States veto. China laid back. They didn't veto. Russia laid back. We actually passed a ceasefire. And uh, yeah, it's in the hands of the players now. It's in the hands of Hamas. It's in the hands of Netanyahu. And neither one of them look very promising. But we're talking about Joe right now. Joe, your left hand is doing that. Uh, Your Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, often says kind of the right things. You know, he falls into that whole, well, civilian casualties are tragic whenever, you know, he falls into that stuff. But many things can be true at the same time. Yes, he's trying. God bless Tony Blinken. He's trying. He's talking to all these people. He's talking to Netanyahu. He's going to Egypt. He's going to Jordan. He's trying to get something done. He's, you know. (sighs) But Joe, does your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Because it does appear that you're trying really hard to find a way to peace. You keep standing up for the two-state solution. You keep calling for a ceasefire. You keep calling for Israel to conduct war, and I can't believe I'm saying this, (laughs) in a legal manner. There are international rules of war. And as I said, the the international um, verdict is that Hamas and Israel are both committing war crimes, and I don't doubt it for a minute. But, uh, well, I I can't say but. I I don't want to, this is a very tricky thing, because I never want to create false equivalency but i also don't want to defend the military arm of hamas but the fact is they haven't killed 37,000 people 37,000 and now nine out of ten children don't have enough food and that's a mild way to put it because a great amount of them are starving and the international court has found israel guilty of several war crimes, including using hunger as a weapon of war. We got these uh, vigilantes literally attacking and stopping the trucks carrying, trying to uh, carry in food and aid. And they're being supported by the IDF. So this just gets worse and worse and worse every week. It doesn't get better. We got this ceasefire agreement that's sitting there that looks like it's dead in the water. God, hope I'm wrong about that. All right. Uh, hey, I want to mention before we go, we've touched on this before, and, and we got to, you and I have to make an appointment to talk about this at length. Um, nationalism, populism, fascism on the rise globally. And it's very concerning. And I, I bring it up now, just a, a couple of quick headlines, and then we'll pick up on this uh, another time. But the EU elections, the European Union elections, were very interesting and very disturbing. A real surge of the far right in Europe, of all places, even in Germany, of all places. God forbid. But you and I have talked about this. The people who are dissatisfied with their lives because the established rule of order is screwing them and leaving them behind. They're not wrong about their own lives. But then they're given no choice because the left and the center left just keep preaching more and more and more of the same that they've been experiencing for their whole lives this last 40, 50 years of money going to the top and insecurity being the... uh, the life story of most people. And then the right-wingers come along with all these promises and they vilify immigrants. That's probably right at the center of it. Racism and anti-immigration is right at the center, right at the center. 
So it's the old, old playbook. It's the old Nazi, fascist, authoritarian playbook. We've seen it historically so many times. I don't know how we don't recognize it now. So yeah, the EU elections were pretty disturbing. The far right is surging. In India, they just finished their elections. And uh, for the first time in a very long time, we have a three-time prime minister, Narendra Modi, the nationalist authoritarian in India, has been able to put together a coalition. Now, the, the good news there, if there is any, like I said, mixed results, his party lost some seats. They lost their majority. Still enough for him to form a government. So he's won re-election, but he's been weakened, and his party is much weaker. What did I read? Let me find that here. Um, yeah, here it is. So over the weekend, he took the, his oath of office along with 71 ministers. 61 of them were from his party. Only seven of them were women, and not one single minister from the Muslim community. See, that's Modi's big thing. He's a Hindu nationalist, and he vilifies Muslims. Just like the orange men is here, and the right wing, you know, his minions, they vilify pretty much everybody, LGBTQ, immigrants of color, especially. Yeah, find scapegoats, uh, create villains, prey on people's bias and bigotry, and then make all sorts of promises to uh, fix the injustice in their lives. And they're not wrong about the injustice. Most people are not getting the benefits of globalism. Like I say, we, get, we haven't got time to get into all this today, but uh, let's make it a point to continue this conversation because these results all around the world are very disturbing. And if they are a foreshadowing of our 2024 election, you know, just like... Uh, Back in 2016, remember the summer of 2016 when Brexit passed in the UK? That was kind of the first shot over the bow, or a big one at least. And um, just a, a couple of months before the November 2016 election, and we all know what happened there. So, yeah, looking at these results is not, um, is not pleasant. Yeah, nationalism, bigotry religious bigotry, anti-democratic. It's a movement, man. It's worldwide. And uh, we got to find a way to fight it. We got to find a way. We got to find a way. All right. Uh, I'll talk to you next week. Uh, time's up for today. As always, you can find this podcast on any of your uh, favorite platforms or go to the website, charlespurcell.com. Contact me, charlespurcell at Gmail follow on Facebook. Thanks to our flagship terrestrial station, River West Radio, riverwestradio.com. And uh, Peter Donalds wrote and performed the theme song. Uh, again, this would be a good time to subscribe to the podcast because uh, just in a few weeks here, we'll be starting some, some extra shows on the big uh, Republican convention here in Milwaukee. All right. See ya.